Hey everybody and welcome to the 100th episode of Behind the Vinyl. For those of you that are not familiar with this feature, it's all over our website at boom973.com. The idea came years ago. We'll get artists to come in, put on their single on the turntable, and then talk about how the song came to be or any stories that might be uh, you know, accompanied with the song. And it turns out that everybody wanted to participate. And thanks to the genius editing of Steve Saylor, we end up with some amazing stories and some stuff that you thought you knew and then you find out, hey, wait, I didn't know that. And that was the whole idea of doing this in the first place. Our very first episode of Behind the Vinyl were the two guys from Spandau Ballet. And as soon as they put the needle on, we found out something right away. They absolutely hated the video for this song. Have a look. It's a beautiful song that it was. Beautiful song. Terrible video, right? Bloody I awful. mean, it's not a terrible, it's a classic oh, video, a right? Video. People know it. Ah. But it. At one point, it was even worse, wasn't it? To be honest, was, we had yeah. that cartoon man wandering Cartoons around. running down the, bot yeah, the bottom of the screen. That we had taken out, do you remember? Yeah, it was Russell Mulcahy did yeah, the video. Yeah, but it, it was right at the beginning, wasn't it? It wasn't in that period where everyone was going away spending 250, quarter of a million yeah, pounds yeah, yeah, on videos. Yeah, yeah. It was just at the beginning of well, it was just MTV. In a, it was just in a, a big, you know, sound stage yeah. or whatever, and uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it was an awful video. I mean, it really was. Well, awful. it was a performance, was, yeah, you know. Yeah, and we, so. we, you know, half the money was spent on that cartoon that, we, and that didn't end up in the final cut. So yeah, it, was, uh, it, was it, it, it was what it was. We're looking back on some of the very special moments of behind the vinyl. Dee Snider came in to talk a little Twisted Sister, in particular the song "We're Not Going to Take It." And I don't know about you, but whenever I hear that song, I think of Christmas. It's not that crazy. Listen. One last thing I want to talk about, we're not going to take it, as we listen to the beginning of Burning Hell, yeah, um, is that years after the song came out, I was driving in a car with a buddy of mine, another musician, and we were talking about songs that had borrowed from other songs. Uh, one of the famous ones is My Sweet Lord, uh, George Harrison's was She's So Fine by the Chiffons. And we we're going through a bunch of songs that it had, had borrowed liberally. And he said, well, if, and of course, we're not going to take it as, oh, come all ye faithful. And I turned and I said, what? <laughs> and he said, we're not going to take it as, oh, come all ye faithful. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, you didn't know that? We're not going to take it, oh, come all ye faithful. I was like, because I sang in the church choir till I was 19 years old, so uh, it has sort of absorbed into my system. So uh, I do owe um, my church choir uh, history the success of Twist Sister. And uh, so kids, go to church, see? And then you write a song like Burn to Hell to follow it up. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cleansing. This is a very special edition of Behind the Vinyl, the 100th edition, and we're looking back at some of these special moments from some of our artists who came in to talk about their records. Run DMC. Remember when they teamed up with Aerosmith in the 80s to do that redo of Walk This Way? Remember the video of Steven Tyler crashing through the wall and then jamming along with what they were doing? Well, it turns out the Run DMC didn't exactly know what they were doing, at least song title-wise. Everything that Walk This Way did, it wasn't the intent. It was one of the dopest breakbeats ever. Matter of fact, it was on a hip-hop breakbeat compilation. And we was in the studio and we was gonna sample it and we was gonna loop it and me and Ron was gonna talk about how good we are. I'm DMC in the place to be, the best MC in history. Been rhyming on the mic since 83. There will never be an MC better than me. And then Ron would go, I'm DJ Ron and I'm number one, whatever, whatever, whatever. So he's in the studio, get ready to sample it and steal their record. Rick Rubin, producer extraordinaire who was working with us at the time on the Raising Hell album, he walks into the studio and he goes, hey guys, what's up? We say, yo, we're getting ready to make this record. And Rick goes, oh, you know what? That's Aerosmith. You know who those guys are? And we was like, what are you talking about? He wanted to give us the 411 on Aerosmith. Me and Ron didn't even know that the name of the record was Walk This Way because we used to just tell the DJs like Jam Master J, yo, get out Toys in the Attic. We knew that was the name of the album and play number four. And it's crazy that number four is number four in our album. This is a very special edition of Behind the Vinyl, looking back at some of the artists that have popped into this very studio to put their records on and tell stories behind the songs. Next up is Steve Earle. You know him for Copperhead Road. And you know Copperhead Road for those amazing, very distinct sounding bagpipes at the beginning of the song. 
those aren't bagpipes. Bagpipe patch. It's not a sample and it's not a bagpipe. It's a, it's a custom built analog synth patch that my keyboard player Kenny Moore built from scratch. And uh, I wanted bagpipes because it sounded lonesome. And I always, from the time that I wrote the song, just on mandolin, the first song I ever played on mandolin too, I, I knew two chords on mandolin when we recorded this. And um, I'd gotten a hold of a mandolin. A friend of mine gave me um, trying to learn how to play it, and I learned how to play that, and that was it. I'm Stu Jeffries. This is a very special edition of Behind the Vinyl. We're looking back at some of the more magical moments of artists coming in to tell us about the makings of or the stories behind their records. Uh, next up, Bare Naked Ladies. They bashed onto the scene in this country with If I Had a Million Dollars, and you know them for that song. But did you know how that song actually came to be? It wasn't in front of a live audience of grown-ups. How did you write this? Uh, I wrote this on a bus on the way back from a music camp. Uh, I wrote it to entertain the kids on the bus on the way back from the camp. And I remember saying to Steve when I got back, oh, you got to hear this song I came up with. The kids all really loved it. And um, it became this thing every time we performed it, we improvised parts of it. And um, in fact, remember doing this in the studio, we recorded it every day. Yeah. Our goal was to get a spontaneous version of it that we liked. Right. So every day we would do a song or two and then do a version of Million Dollars. That's right. Every day. Yeah, because I think we were a little bit, this is our first full length studio album, so we're like yeah. a little bit daunted by, you know, the whole process and to get the spontaneity every day. That's right. This is a very special edition of Behind the Vinyl. I'm Stu Jeffries, and next up, my good friend Ray McGuire from Trooper, kind enough to pop in and tell us the story behind their signature song, Raise a Little Hell. And when you hear this, you'll never think of this song the same again. Like, imagine if that wasn't the actual title. Canadian radio stations, if you can imagine this now, <clears throat> Canadian radio stations, like well over half of them say, this song's too heavy, we can't can't play this in the daytime. They wouldn't play this song until after six o'clock, eight o'clock at night. Record company freaks out, re-releases the single. So they used to release a, a 45 to radio with the same song on both sides. Record company re-releases a single, sends it to all the radio stations with Round Round We Go on the other side, which is a song that they could play in the daytime, which they did play in the daytime. So now we have two songs on the radio, one before six and one after six. So the the song, um, the song didn't uh, st didn't seem like it had much of a chance, but it ended up becoming arguably our most well-known, popular song. Randy didn't even want it. He wanted us to change the name to "Raise a Little Howl" because he was Mormon. And uh, hell. Maybe that's why they didn't want to play it before 6 o'clock. I'm Stu Jeffries. This is a very special edition of Behind the Vinyl, looking back at some of the artists that have popped in to tell us the stories behind their songs. There is no one more well-spoken, I think, than Howard Jones, and he's always got a great story to tell. And he doesn't disappoint in No One Is To Blame. It's got some amazing lines in it, like aspirations in the clouds, but your hopes go down the drain. But there is one particular one, line in this song, inspired by a club DJ. Have a watch. The interesting sort of genesis of the writing of it was that, again, you know, I hadn't written any of these songs after Humans Live, and I, I was on the road, and so really all my um, input was coming from traveling and people I was meeting, and, and I was in San Francisco with a record company guy. We were just going to um, a radio station there. I'm crossing the road, and he says to me, um, what do you think of all the amazing women here in San Francisco, you know, all these gorgeous women? And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, fantastic. They're really amazing. Like women in, uh, you know, all the cities around the world, they're amazing. Um, I said, you know, I've got my Jan and I'm really happy with her and I'm really sorted with my, with my relationship. He said to me, you can look at the menu, but you don't have to eat. And, you know, having lived a sort of sheltered life I'd never really heard that expression before and it 
sort of songwriter's brain goes into gear and think, oh man, it could be a really great starting point for a song um, because it's like, but I turned it slightly to be about wanting things that you couldn't really have. And if you did have them, big trouble would probably um, ensue. <laughs> This is Behind the Vinyl edition number 100 as we look back on some of the more special moments of artists coming in to put their records on this very turntable and tell us a story or two behind them. Christmas time cannot come or go if you don't hear Do They Know It's Christmas at least 100 times. And at least in those 100 times, the hair on my arms go up. I get that goose bumpy feeling. It's just such a magical, magical record. And musically, it sounds like the world is involved in this song. Not so. I played all the instruments on this. Um, except uh, Phil Collins' drums, of course. <laughs> Poor old Phil, he had, he had one day off uh, from recording his album. He was in London, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and it was his one day off. And he came in and sat with all the artists. And uh, while I'm trying to get vocal performances out of everyone, who had never heard the song, by the way, none of them, had heard this. Phil sat for five hours and every so often his head would pop up and he'd say, you ready for me yet boss? I'd say, half an hour Phil. He said, okay. And he sat there absolutely perfectly. He got up to do his drums eventually. Did it perfectly. Perfectly. First take was brilliant. And he thought he overplayed. So he did another take and simplified it. And that's what's on the record. I'm Stu Jeffries. This is a special edition of Behind the Vinyl, edition number 100, as a matter of fact, where we look back on some of the artists that have popped into the studio to tell us the stories behind their songs and maybe brag a little bit about their musicianship. That didn't happen all that often. As a matter of fact, most of our guests were actually pretty humble, but no one more so than Alex Lifeson, who thinks if he just gets a little bit better, he might amount to something. And structurally, the song is a weird kind of song. It starts with a verse, and then it goes into sort of uh, a bridge, and then it goes into another section, and then it comes back in, the chorus, and uh, you know, it's kind of all over the place. It's not a traditional sort of uh, arrangement. Uh, and it's, like I said, it's a hard song to play for, well, for some people. <laughs> For me, it's a breeze, but that's because my parts are very simple, and um, I'm I'm working on that. Now. So hopefully, I'll get better. This is a very special edition of Behind the Vinyl, edition number 100, and time for one more clip as we look back on some of the great moments of artists coming into the studio to tell us all about their songs. This one goes to Randy Bachman while playing with BTO, and this story is pretty amazing. And it also gives hope to all of you out there that are part-time pizza jockeys and jockettes. There just might be a rock future for you. And then when we were recording it, there was a knock at the door and a guy standing there with three or four pizzas. And we had already been in the studio 14 hours and he said, did you guys order the pizza? And I said, no, down the hall, Steve Miller was recording his Fly Like an Eagle album and War was doing their Why Can't We Be Friends album. So I said, go down the hall and ask for Steve Miller, or ask for Jerry in the, in the next studio. And then he came back and the song was still playing. We were putting on our coats, it was about one o'clock in the morning. And he said, uh, that song sounds like you could really use a piano. And I said, yeah, I'd like to get Elton John or Little Richard, but they're kind of in LA right now having a party. And he said, I'm a piano player, will you give me a shot? And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, just, I've been listening to the song, it's real easy, it's three chords. So uh, I said, okay, he wrote down the chords and the spaces on a napkin. We threw a mic in the piano, he played the piano and left. And uh, the next day, Charlie Fatch came into our studio and he said, let me hear the song. And I said to the engineer, when you play it, don't play the piano track. We hadn't heard it back, we just let him play one take. I thought I'd give him a break and I'd erase it the next day. So we come back in and Charlie, I said, when you play TCB, keep the piano track down. But halfway through the song, the engineer pushed up the volume and then came the piano and Charlie said, what is that? BTO at the piano? That's incredible because Elton John owns Top 40 Radio and Album Radio and you having keyboards will get you some real estate on Top 40 Radio because all you guys, ZZ and Doobies and Frampton, you're all the same. Your guitar, bass and drums. Aerosmith, you're all the same. 
having you having the piano, we give you some Elton John space on Top 40 Radio. Play it again. We backed it up, played the whole thing with the piano. He said, that's amazing. Who's playing the piano? And I said, a pizza delivery guy. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching this very special edition of Behind the Vinyl. So much fun to look back and uh, hear again some of the great stories that these artists have told us about their records. The best part is when we first started this, you know, we really had no idea how it was going to go. And yet now here we are 100 editions later and there seems to be no end in sight. If you go to boom973.com right now, we've only looked at like 10 moments. There are piles of moments and every story equally as interesting. Find out a little bit more about your favorite artists and your favorite songs. That was the whole idea behind the vinyl. We think mission accomplished, but you know, it's all up to you. Go to boom973.com and check out more stories. And thanks for your time.